It is good to see all of you in the house of the Lord. And I did welcome you at the outset, but I suppose a second welcome is in order because there are some of you who have uh, slipped in, and I use the word slipped in in a nice way, not in a bad sense, uh, after my first welcome. So good to see all of you in the house of the Lord. Now, uh, I do want to thank uh, Neil and the worship team for leading us in worship today, and thank you, Thomas, for leading us in the reading of God's Word, and it was good to see Denu join the worship team today. And uh, Denu, yes, yes, okay, that was, that was spontaneous. And uh, so Denu, uh, as you heard me say before, St. Augustine said the reward for good work is, finish it for me, more work. So, so just make sure you remind Denu about that. Now, we are continuing our series on stewardship. If you remember, last Sunday, I opened up the story of Eliezer. And Eliezer was uh, the, servant of, uh, uh, the servant of Abraham, the chief steward of uh, Abraham. And he was tasked with finding uh, a girl, a wife for his master's son. Now, in some cultures, they call these matchmaking. Not in all the cultures. In some cultures, they call this matchmaking. And uh, I came across this little story. It's called the politics of matchmaking. Now, as I read the story to you, I want to alert you not to over-spiritualize this, not to overthink the story, and not to theologize and philosophize the story. It's just a story to warm you up to the reflection that is to come. So here's how the story goes. It's titled, uh, The Politics of Matchmaking. I told my son, you will marry the girl I choose. And my son said, never. And I told him, but she is Bill Gates' daughter. And then he said, well, in that case, yes. I called Bill Gates and I said, I want your daughter to marry my son. Bill Gates said, never. I told Bill Gates, my son is a vice president at the World Bank. And Bill Gates said, in that case, yes. I called the president of the World Bank and asked him to make my son one of his vice presidents. And he says, never, I don't even know your son. And I told him my son is Bill Gates' son-in-law. And then he said, in that case, yes. Now that's called the politics of matchmaking. The story ends there. Uh, I'm not trying to give you Bible verses to support my story, but we must move on with the reflection. So as I mentioned, we have been on this journey, we have been reflecting on this journey of stewardship. And we have been doing that by looking at the journey that this man Eliezer undertook, where he was uh, on this mission to find a wife for his master's son. And as you look at Eliezer's journey, we begin to realize that yes, stewardship is a journey. It does begin when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, where we discover that, yes, we had our natural talents that we were blessed with at birth, but at spiritual birth, we also have spiritual gifts that God has bestowed upon us. And so stewardship begins at the point when we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it doesn't end there. We continue to journey. And we grow, we mature, we look for opportunities to utilize, to serve God using our gifts and our talents. As we continue to grow, we recognize that the call is about being faithful stewards. And hopefully, our lives will end, the journey of stewardship will end, where we could echo the words of Irma Bombeck, her famous words, where she said, when I stand before God one day, I want to be able to say, God, I have nothing left. I used all the talents and all the gifts that you gave me. That, in a nutshell, is the journey of stewardship. 
But today, we get back to our story, and uh, thank you, Thomas, once again for leading us in the sto- uh, leading us in the reading of God's Word. I do apologize. There are some names that are quite confusing, uh, but that's not your fault. What can we do? Uh, some of those uh, names of cities and places. But our story unfolds today where Eliezer is now at the well. If you remember last week, we talked about the fact that he had questions he asked of Abraham and uh, he asked those questions just to make sure that he had all the ideas that were relevant to the mission. And now he's journeyed with the 10 camels as you listened in the reading. And he is now at uh, the town where Nahor lived. Nahor, by the way, is Abraham's brother. He's at the well. Now, many things happened at wells during those times in that age and in that culture. This was before the era of pipe-borne water and people traveled quite some distance to the wells to get water. And the well was the place where many other things happened. If you want to listen to the gossip in the town or the village, I know that's a strange word for you because we Christians just do not entertain or tolerate gossip, but the other churches do. But I'm just saying, if you wanted to pick up on the latest happenings in town, in the village, you went to the well. If you wanted to draw water, you went to the well, but everybody came to the well, so you had to wait your turn. And while you waited, you chatted with people. You met people. If you wanted to make connections, uh, what's going on in the world at that time, it happened at the well. If you wanted to see what the latest fashion trends and what was trending in society, you picked it up at the well. So many things happened at the well. It was the dynamic equivalent of social media today or malls today. You want to meet people, you go to the mall, or you go to Facebook, you meet new people, or even LinkedIn for that matter. You want to find out what's the new job opening, any opportunities in the village, you talk to people at the well. So this is something that Eliezer knew as a man of that time and that age and that culture, and he went to the well. He knew that everybody from the village of Nahor, Abraham's brother, They would come to the well. And they came in the evening because that's the time the sun was setting. Now I know that Nira did pray for the sun. Where is Nira? Okay. Oh, there you are. Nira prayed for the sun and she was thanking God for the sun. Yes, we do agree. But in that part of the world, the sun came out pretty strong during the afternoon. So it was only in the evening that they came out to get their water. And so all these people gathered and Eliezer gets into business. So from this story at the well, I want to share three insights that actually connect to stewardship. And the first one is that stewardship is beyond the superficial. And you see that in this part of the story. And if you listen to what Thomas read, Eliezer prays. We talked about this the last week, that he was an excellent steward and he was a man of prayer. Not just prayer, but a man of prayer followed and coupled with action. He moved in his faith. He did things as a result of prayer. And here we see that uh, stewardship is beyond the superficial. He prays and his prayer is very interesting. He says, God, the girl who offers me water when I ask her, thank you very much, that's good service, Noah. Uh, The girl who offers me water when I request for water, she is the one that I will start focusing on. That's a request that I'm going to make. And you know that's basic hospitality. In any culture, if you ask for water, uh, people will give. You must be really, really hard-hearted to refuse people water when they ask for it. And so she asks for water, and he said, God, but on her own accord, she's got to be willing to provide water for my camels. 
Now, in our age, that sounds like a pretty easy task because if you want to water not 10 but 100 camels in this age, you go to the Toronto Zoo, you will see if they want to water their animals, they plug one end of the hose and at the other end of the hose, they fill the troughs or whatever else the animals are feeding. But in that age, when Eliezer placed this fleece or this condition, where Rebecca or the lady that God had prepared would of her own accord say, I will water your camels. That was a huge monumental task. And let me explain why. Because there were no, there were no pipes at the time. And as you read the story, you will see that she went down to the spring and would have to bring water up. Now, what do you know about camels and water? they can drink a lot of water, not just half a bottle like you and me, uh, or you know, just like myself. They need lots of water. And so imagine Rebecca having to make these many trips down to the stream, down and up again, until all the camels had had their fill. And I like to see this as Eliezer placing a test to test Rebecca's character. The Bible says she was a beautiful girl. Well, that's nice and wonderful. We appreciate that. But he was going deeper. This was a question of character. Because when he said, God, she must water all my camels, it meant that she would see the ten camels kneeling down. I'm sure you've seen pictures of camel kneeling down in the desert. And uh, she would be sensitive to the situation. There are two essential characteristics he's looking for. One is she would be sensitive to the needs of the people and the situation. She wouldn't look at the 10 camels and say, nice camels, where did you get them? She realized these camels need watering. And secondly, she was willing to do a difficult task that requires immense patience. And so here is Eliezer looking for something deep as he is serving his master. Now you might ask, what's the connection to stewardship? The connection is very simple. That stewardship is a very deep thing. It is going beyond the, super, the superficial. It is going beyond the surface. The Apostle Paul captures this very well in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. You see that one look at Noah and he knows exactly what to do. Uh, this is called silent communication. And in verse 23 and 24, here's the Apostle Paul, Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, we're not going to bring it up, Noah, don't worry. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, now that you are alive in Christ, you need to live according to that calling. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, I have talked to you in the first three chapters, first two chapters about being alive in Christ and all the spiritual blessings, all that is nice. But now you better start living out your Christian life. And then he comes down to verse 23 and 24 and look what he says. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. And he's telling these people in Colossae, when you work, wherever God has placed you, it might be in your office, it might be in your workplace, in the community, in your schools, wherever you are, and whatever you do, remember you are doing it for the Lord. And that's an important principle of stewardship. It's going beyond the superficial. It's going, it's going deeper and looking into a person's character. So think about ourselves. We are all stewards. God has placed us to serve as his stewards in different spheres. And sometimes our work is not appreciated. And sometimes we face criticism. Sometimes people don't flow with us when we're trying to do things. 
And the natural human response is to come back or to move back. As uh, Aldefers in his theory says, the regression takes place and we slip down to a lower level of motivation. But the Apostle Paul says here, when you do something, remember you do it as unto the Lord, which means that even if people don't appreciate me at work, even if they're giving me a hard time, I am conscious that this is where God has placed me. It might be in production, it might be in marketing, it might be in school. This is where God has placed me and therefore whatever I do, I do it as unto the Lord. And when you have that mindset, you continue to do your best, mindful that it is the Lord that who will reward you one day. The second insight that I want to share from the incident at the well is that stewardship embraces a sense of urgency. Now, in the story, in Genesis chapter 4, on two occasions, we pick up this sense of urgency. Number one, in verse 33, they have now taken him to their house, Laban's house, and they offer him food. And Elias says, I'm not eating any food. I'm not sitting down to talk to you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sitting down to eat un until I have shared with you the mission that I have come about. There is a sense of urgency here. The second example we see is in verse 54. Uh, yes, in verse 54, he says, now that Rebecca has agreed to come with us back to Isaac's place, let's leave now. And the family says, stay for a few more days. He says, no, I am on a mission and I need to complete this mission. And stewardship does embrace a sense of urgency. Now, sometimes we get urgency or a sense of urgency and mission mixed up with being in a hurry. A sense of urgency does not mean that you are in a hurry, that you have to rush through everything all the time. A sense of urgency or a sense of mission means that you have a sense of priority. You know what is essential. You know the core essentials of your calling. You know the core essentials of your mission. And as a result of that, you are willing to deprioritize or move all those unnecessary things down to the periphery. You are willing to shed all those unimportant matters that are essential to your calling and your sense of mission. So being in a hurry is not equal to a sense of mission and a purpose. So you come to Elias' story, you will realize that uh, he was a man who embraced this sense of urgency, this sense of mission. And as we think of 2024, there are many things that, uh, that fight, that compete for our loyalty, uh, for our time. And we need to understand that stewardship means prioritizing what needs to get done and not just hurrying through life and saying that we are busy. In 2 Samuel 18, there's an interesting young man. His name is Ahimaaz. I'm sure many of us have not heard of Ahimaaz. But he comes running to King David and they ask him, what are you running for? And why are you running? He says, I don't know. I saw some excitement somewhere and I started to run. Now I hope that 2024, uh, you will not be like Ahimaaz, where you're hurrying and running and people ask him, why are you hurrying? And you say, I don't know. I'm just running because everybody's running, I'm running too. But Eliezer was a man of purpose, he was a man of mission and because of that we see that he was able to say, no sitting down to eat, yes food is good, no sitting down to eat, I am on a mission and I want to share that with you. This is my master's mission. And even when it comes to stewardship, we are about the master's business. And so we need to ensure that we prioritize our God-given calling and our God-given sense of mission. 
Let me tell you this story. You may have heard of it before, but this is from the era where trains did not have these uh, automatic doors. These days, you know, at a certain time, all the doors closed. This was many years ago where you could run and hop on and hop off trains uh, anytime the train was going at a certain speed. So three men were at the station, at a certain station, and uh, they had uh, come off to see a friend. So they were there and they discovered that they had an half, uh, they had about 30 minutes before the train would actually depart. And so they decided to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, whatever the case may be, depending on where the story came from. They sat down and they were chatting away, reliving all those old, uh, good old days. And suddenly they discovered that it was time for the train to depart. So they ran. And just as they got to the platform to their dismay, they discovered that the train was pulling out. Slowly, of course, but it was pulling out. It was gathering speed, but slowly. And so all three men started to run. And the first man made it on the train. The second man made it on the train. By this time, the train was going at a reasonably fast pace, and so the third man could not make it. He missed the train. He stood there for a minute, and then he bent down, and he started to laugh. He started to laugh uncontrollably. And the person in charge of the station came to him and said, you missed the train, and why are you laughing? He said, true, I missed the train, but those two men on the train, they actually came to see me off at the station. So we were all running and running, and they got carried away, and they should not be on that train. So that's the story of being in a hurry doesn't mean that you are on a mission. You might be heading to some place because everybody else is running, you're running as well. But Eli Elias, he was a man of mission. And that's why he said, business first, this is about the master's business. My third insight is that after the mission, he disappears. You don't hear anything else about Eliezer in the Bible. There are other Eliezers, but not this Eliezer. Now, I know that an argument from silence in the field of logic is notoriously unreliable. And I'm not using that uh, argument here, but I'm saying, if you look at Genesis chapter 24, if you study Eliezer's character, Eliezer's character, and the manner in which he went about this, or his business, it is safe to assume that when he took Rebecca back and handed her over to Isaac, he slipped back into his old role as the chief steward. He was not a show person who said, well, I brought your wife, so can I have a stake in the game from now on? I want to be promoted to such and such. Very likely, he went back to continue to serve. And that's what stewardship does. It serves the master, but when the mission is done, you just get back and continue with life as usual. No fanfare for yourself, because we believe that stewardship is about doing what the master wants us to do. And in doing this, Eliezer joins a league of some very special leaders like Barnabas in the New Testament, Jonathan in the Old Testament, Ananias who helped Paul come to know the Lord, Joseph of Arimathea, and Dorcas, and those ladies who always assisted our Lord Jesus Christ. They did what they could from behind the scenes, they were not wanting the front stage or the limelight. When their mission was done, they faded into oblivion, as it were. They were just gone. They disappeared because their mission was accomplished. For them, it was about the master. And so I pray and I hope that even as we look at 2024, that these thoughts on stewardship, would be thoughts that we would take to heart and we would continue to serve our God faithfully, knowing that like Eliezer, we are about the master's business. I now invite the worship team to come and lead us in our response, uh, song of response. <laughs>